This is Twit. Well, folks, we are here yet again to talk uh, again to and about people making and breaking the tech news. And uh, there was a big breaking story on Tuesday. Uh, one zero. That's Medium's uh, publication reported that the CEO of a surveillance and artificial intelligence company called Banjo uh, had been associated with members of the KKK in his youth um, and was also involved in a shooting at a synagogue in Tennessee. Uh, that story, of course, is available on uh, One Zero, but it brought to light kind of a bigger conversation that I happen to have been sort of having separately without <laughs> this knowledge. Uh, and it's, it's one that we regularly have. And it talks about how artificial intelligence, because of uh, its creation by humans, which are inherently biased, results in bias itself. And I'm excited to have Dave Gershgorn here with us to talk about bias in AI. Welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, good, good, good. Uh, so let's let's kick things off. Um, could you give, I think we, you know, we kind of got the basics down there, but um, could you talk about what exactly Banjo is, who or what uh, organizations were using Banjo, and then we can kind of break into the, the larger story here of, of bias and AI. Totally. So Banjo is a company um, that sells basically one product called Lifetime. And what that, com what that product does is import tons of data from um, different sources like social media. Um, the, in Utah, they were connected to the CCTVs uh, that the public safety department had. Um, it was like highway traffic cameras, things like that. Um, and this company sold event detection. So if, they, if something were to happen that was noteworthy to one of their clients that you they would receive a some sort of automated alert. Um, at least that's what that what's that's what Banjo says. Um, we don't have a lot of visibility into how this works, how the algorithm works. You know, uh, today um, and yesterday kind of came to light that the state of Utah is uh, pausing a lot of the contracts with Banjo, and Banjo itself is pausing its own. Uh, use of its of its tool in Utah um, until the audits are able to be completed. Um, so I the comp the company has about two hundred employees. Um, they're based in Las Vegas and California and they have two offices in Utah. So um, they yeah so the, the, so Utah uh, the attorney general had to contract with them. The Department of Public Safety had a contract with them which was worth twenty million dollars. Um, and there are likely more that we don't know about. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, <laughs> this is obviously given the the use of the product and, and sort of the the groups that use the product. I think that's uh, what really kind of shines a light on this. But the fact is, a lot of companies and a lot of uh, organizations make use of of machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, deep learning, all these different tools in different ways. And you know, folks might not even realize that many of their devices are making use of these types of, of, of tools uh, day to day. So the fact is with a, with a system that is so, uh, that permeates our sort of ecosystem so much, we have to be aware of, of the biases that are in place. And I think that you described it perfectly in your article. And I don't, you know, I don't want to give him, give everything away. I want people to go check out the article, but could you use your, could you tell us your pet metaphor? Cause I think it's great. Oh no, I have a pet metaphor. No, I have to look yes. at my article. I, uh, <laughs> um, I, I did have a little, um, something that I was, I was thinking about in terms of predictive policing where, I mean, I think there's a, a really, uh, kind of, classic example that that is an argument against uh using just straight data from p police um mm -hmm. in terms of predictive policing where um it has been well documented that communities of color are policed more heavily 
across the board. Um, and because those communities are policed more, there's more data being fed into the machine about those communities. And crime seems higher there because there's a higher police presence and the police are, are you know, uh, writing people up for more tickets. They are arresting more people in those areas. So the algorithm sees that glut of data from that specific community um, and uh, assumes, oh, there's a lot of crime there. Um, and then it sends the police there again. So this is a societal bias that gets encoded into an algorithm and kind of just perpetuates um, this, this uh, these kind of um, biases that are already present. Um, and when I was talking to Meredith Whitaker, the co-founder of AI Now, about this, um, she was sure to point out that like these – the people who are lose out and the people who are uh, persecuted more by these algorithmic systems are the people who are already being punished by society and the people who are already um, experiencing the harm of societal bias. Um, so it's, it's nothing that's necessarily new but we're – coding these systems, these societal biases and these societal systems into our software. Um, and this is a opportunity to kind of look at the kinds of values we want our machine learning algorithms to have and um, strive to be better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the example that that you gave is is about uh, and it's it's sort of a simple explanation of, of how we create these tools and therefore may introduce a uh, bias without realizing it. Uh, so I'm going to flip it on its head. You say if you're a dog person, I am one. And so I'm biased. So I'm going to change it. Uh, if you're a cat person and you're training an algorithm with uh, a, a library of cats, well, you are going to use, you know, millions of pictures of cats as you're going through and saying, yes, this is a cat. Yes, this is a cat. Yes, this is a cat. But you might only use a thousand pictures of a dog. So then you say, no, this is not a cat. No, this is not a cat. But if you don't have the entire scope of both of those and, and other animals as well, no, this is actually a ferret, not a cat, then you are going to introduce bias into the system where at times it's going to believe uh, this actually is not a cat and then it ends up being a cat or vice versa. Um, I like that sort of breaking it down a little bit. And, you know, you touch there on we, we have these simple tools. Uh, you know, I can remember an app that I think was uh, you fed it a picture and then it determined if the if the photo that you sent it was a burrito or not a burrito. Those are simple tools. Yes. But these things go even deeper than that. And you mentioned Amazon is one instance where artificial intelligence, they've used that in the past, correct? Yeah. So this was a, a report from Reuters um, that was about a year or two ago. And Amazon had been trying to internally develop a hiring uh, tool that was like, it was like the, the holy grail was that you could feed it a whole bunch of resumes and it would give you the top five. And then you just hire those people. That's like basically what they wanted to be able to do. But it but it was based on resumes that Amazon had gotten, which is a so, like a reflection of a subsection of the technology industry, um, and that meant that there were a lot of similarities. The the tech industry isn't known for um, being incredibly diverse um, in in a lot of ways, especially in in certain positions. So um, it was a lot. It was very heavily male dominated, and it got it was the algorithm. Uh, was so male dominated that if there was a uh, reference to a woman's college or a any part of the the resume had the word woman in it, it would be downranked um, because these male um, factors were so influential in the algorithm. So it it that's just one example of how the training data that you have, even if you intend it to to be you know as unbiased as possible, um, can kind of uh, shade the um, the algorithm's final decision to be different than what you intended. Amazon ended up scrapping it. They didn't use it because it didn't work. I mean, that's mm -hmm. uh, one of the things where um, if you don't have a, a kind of good head on your shoulders and you're not making smart decisions, um, I mean, it working is a kind of a subjective phrase. Touching back on, um, Micah, your example with the cat and then you mentioned, you know, and maybe a ferret comes up along the way. The question that I have along this line is 
like maybe the creators of this algorithm never knew that a ferret was even part of the equation to begin with. Like there was just no record. Like they might know that a cat versus a dog, that makes a lot of sense, but ferret never even entered the picture. Um, how can creators of these systems kind of ensure that they're focusing on everything equally, even in light of the fact that there will inevitably be variables that they could not have predicted or maybe hadn't identified yet. That seems like a big part I think of it, it too. I agree. And I think that a lot of it is talking to a lot of people and not doing your work in a vacuum. I, I think it is um, very important for people to, for machine learning researchers and engineers to be talking about subject domain experts and sociologists and understanding deeply how their systems work in the larger, larger scopes of society. Audits are incredibly important, like the ones that uh, Banjo is about to go through, according to the uh, Attorney General of Utah's office. Um, I think transparency, visibility, documentation, um, all of this is becoming a lot more of the norm as people realize that these algorithmic systems have incredible impact in our society. Um, and I think that with transparency, with proper documentation of, of limitations and um, being really transparent about how the algorithms are actually developed um, and fostering those, those conversations between people who have been studying societal systems for, you know, their entire careers um, and understanding how algorithms can fit into that in a better way that doesn't bring the worst of humanity into our future. Um, I think it's, it's critically important and it's not something that we are unable to do. It's extremely possible if people are willing to communicate and put in the extra effort 